Dr. Mike Robinson, the Chief Sci uh, Scientific Advisor, Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture. And he will be talking about getting the horse before the cart, a critical step that enables successful seed scaling. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Mike Robinson. I'm from the Syngenta Foundation. We're based in Basel, Switzerland. Um, the title, Getting the Horse Before the Cart, um, obviously, I think you're getting a feeling of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, it, uh, the aspect of getting the order of demand right uh, in, in a seed system is critical in its long-term um, success. It turns out that, uh, that farmers, uh, I guess, have known about uh, getting things in the right order for a long time. And, um, and uh, as demonstrated here. So I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I'm going, about our foundation, but especially then what do we mean about getting it in the right order? What is the demand-led approach to um, seed system development? Um, we've gone in our foundation a bit further and uh, tried to develop a concept, a service, really, to help push this approach. and. Um, I, I, I can blatantly say today uh, it's, a, it's a pitch for partnership, really. We'd like to be able to work with this SIL, the Soybean Innovation Lab initiative, um, to deliver the outputs of your program, uh, you know, that last mile. Um, uh, I will say something about the success we've had with this approach in the past and ultimately what to, um, how, how we hope to be able to work with you. Um, so, who are we? We're, um, we're a non-profit organization. We're separate from the company. We are independent. We have our own board, um, increasingly independently funded as well. Um, we have a global focus, generally on pre-commercial, what we call pre-commercial farmers. We're trying to help those farmers that want to interact and work with value chains enter into them and um, provide, by providing them services and knowledge and technologies. Uh, I guess we also could say that we work mainly with pre-commercial crops too. So soybeans an in interesting example here, the type of crop where it is a bit tougher to get that, that system going. Um, we're global, as I said, we have about 100 staff around the world, but only a very small headquarters uh, based in, in Basel. Our mission, we, want to, we are ambitious and want to reach millions of smallholder farmers in a sustainable way. I think that's, that's important, not only environmentally sustainable, but economically sustainable. We want to see a future in farming for existing and for the future farmers too, the young farmers as we heard earlier. Um, these are the areas where we work, um, subtropical regions around the world, East and West Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, Latin America, and um, the sorts of crops there, if you can pick up, we work on cereal crops, we work on vegetables, um, we work on tuber crops too, or clonal crops, and beans too, I guess those two are good examples of, of difficult crops um, to get a seed system going in because, of course, um, the, the temptation is, is to keep on regrowing the same, uh, you know, the same seed as you plant, and, and as a result, you see inevitably a, a, a slide in yield and quality. So um, I'll say something about what we mean about meeting market demand. Um, I guess this, this model here is the, uh, the one we're used to as technologists, as scientists, which is, is to, as plant breeders, to deliver the outputs of our program to a seed producer and a seed distributor and eventually gets to the farmers. And the farmers get involved in breeding and replanting that same um, seed, so therefore, uh, the demand is in that sort of closed loop there. I think what, so what you might classify that as is 
to some extent, a technology push system, which um, organizations sometimes like our own as donors get involved in. We would like to see improved technology in the hands of smallholder farmers, but, but maybe sometimes we are missing the other half of the picture. And, and that is, below this line here, the, 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 the critical factor in long-term sustainability beyond the farm. And increasingly now, as we see farmers getting engaged in value chains, it's what, how, they're well, how they're connected into those downstream wholesaler, processor, uh, retailer, and, and, and broader consumer markets. We have to consider what their needs are in order to drive the demand from all the way from the farmer going all the way back to the plant breeders. And that's, I think, what we mean by demand-led pull. And that's what we mean about getting the horse and cart in the right order. How do we, how do we breed for um, market demand? And what do we mean by that? Uh, I think I can give you an example here, a generic example of, of, on the top left, I think probably something that we're all familiar with and get used to, which is, you know, we want, we're, we're focused on crop performance and resilience, and it's really important to get those traits right. Yield, pest and disease resistance, other agronomic characteristics um, and, and environmental adaptation are really important, and that's, as breeders, uh, that's often our primary focus. But if we do that at the expense of those other boxes, then there becomes this risk that we're not playing to the demand in the market, to the broader market, and therefore actually probably to some extent even jeopardizing the long-term success of those farmers that we mean to help in the first place. So we've got to look further than that. We've got to look at how the seed producers and distributors, um, you know, what traits they need uh, in those crops. So uh, the, the, the cost of production, the, the scale-up uh, properties, and then further downstream on the right, um, what the consumers want at the end of the day, the taste, the appearance, nutrition, of course, nowadays being very high on that list. Um, cooking qualities, too. And then, and then, again, especially for this crop, the processing traits are extremely important. And the sooner those processes are brought into the equation of of, of the breeding cycle and also, you know, the trials and, and registration of new crops, the better. I've had a go. Uh, I should, I should, uh, I should dis openly disclose here that, that uh, um, as Pete said, uh, soybean is new to me, too, uh, in developing countries. So I don't have that much technical expertise around it, but I've had a go at trying to produce a... Um, a profile for a tropically adapted soybean. And, um, and again, on the top left is probably the characteristics that, that are high on our list and extremely important, especially the adaptation to day length and, and related to that altitude, I guess, and some of the other agronomic properties you can see there. Um, but I think, uh, that I think some of the other factors, viability, seed viability in the bottom, um, bottom left, uh, extremely important. Uh, I think probably seed quality is the thing that's going to drive this value chain at the end of the day. So it's got to be extremely good and controllable. And then on the right, I think there's an interest, of course, in trying to link soybeans, new so tropically adapted soybean varieties into the emerging um, processing um, uh, capacity that's building increasingly in, um, in Africa and other regions too. So what have we done to try and take this approach forward? We've developed this concept called uh, Seeds to Be. And um, 
what is seeds to be? Well, seeds to be uh, has a number of pillars. Basically, it, what it's trying to do is, uh, firstly, work on the left-hand side with the policy aspects of um, um, uh, the seed sector, basically trying to encourage uh, regional harmonization uh, and, and liberalize national policies. There are, uh, there, are, uh, there are parts of the world where um, restrictive national uh, policies uh, are really working against trying to deliver good quality seed to farmers and into those subsequent value chains. So policy is a very important part of it. Then we have two sort of technology transfer models. One, one on the top, which is about bringing technology from one part of the world to another. So in this case, we'd be looking for tropically adapted soybean from, let's say, uh, well, Brazil, that you might be able to take into Africa. And then um, basically assessing it there, basically working with the technology owners to uh, end the local organizations, companies, public or private, that, uh, that uh, will be op will operate in that new value chain, helping to de-risk that entry. And we then also do full transfer model where, where we encourage a local production of the seed and there we'll facilitate licensing, we'll work with the public sector and bridge, bridge over to the private sector. Inevitably, it is the smaller, small, medium-sized seed company that we work with, as you see, um, and then, most importantly, we're getting the demand side primed for that seed. So straight away, we start to work with processes, start to work with distributors, retailers, off-takers, we call, so there may be contract-based uh, programs um, to actually uh, um, uh, encourage demand for the seed at the end of the day. Because if there's no demand there, however good the seed company is, they're not going to be successful. There's other aspects too, like the, the, the environment in which that seed is sold, insurance, as I say, credit and savings are extremely important, all issues raised so far this morning. Here's an example of what, we, um, what we're doing in pre-commercial crops. Um, this, this, um, these axes show subsistence versus um, cash crop and, and the development of the seed sector. And you can see the, gr the green area is the one that we're focusing. The ones in the top right probably are well served already. The hybrid crops, uh, hybrid vegetables, hybrid maize doing pretty well and also with strong private uh, sector engagement. We're looking at that green area. Um, gives you some examples there. I've, I mentioned already beans, um, potatoes, and cassava. These are all extremely difficult seed systems to get in place. So we have some experience on how you might do that. Um, soybean I put there. Uh, it's approximately in the right uh, region. Um, and what we hope to do is to work in such difficult areas uh, to help identify opportunities for investment and get local private sector investment coming into that seed system. Here's some examples of what we do already uh, in the last two or three years. Um, so we're doing technology transfer, you can see, coming between South Asia and East and uh, West Africa. We do technology transfer from, from Europe into Africa. Um, we're, we're trying to focus on, on the, the, a certain number of, of pre-commercial crops, if you like, and, uh, but increasing that, you can see our, the number of trials that we have to carry out uh, each year is increasing. And I think uh, this year we'll probably be doing close to about um, 12 or 13,000 different uh, plots uh, in, in 2013. So you can see the number of companies involved as well, breeders or technology owners, uh, 23 um, interested parties this year, 110 different varieties. So there's a lot of interest, a lot of demand in this, in this approach to bring technology and move it around at the, to the right place at the right time in the right environment. 
And what is the environment? I think this gives you an idea of what we mean about trying to develop a demand-led approach. I think if you begin on the left, the breeders, of course, we're, we're familiar with. That's what we do. But, and then eventually, we would like to link them into the seed companies. But of course, the seed companies need some, some forward, forward market commitments. And that's when it's important for the seed companies to know in ahead what sort of perhaps farmer aggregation exists uh, in terms of organizing farmers to grow for certain, um, for certain value chains and what sort of other services those aggregations might have. And then ultimately link them to the off-takers, the processors and the canners, etc. And I think I've overlaid that to a real examples of where we're working now. Lots of different public and private sector breeders a number of local, medium-sized, uh, small and medium-sized um, um, seed companies, extremely important to, to give these seed companies some long-term uh, confidence to invest. Uh, many different farmer aggregators, pay maybe in numbers of now into the millions, really, of farmers. What we mean by aggregators, of course, is, is organizations like Technoserve that, that work closely with groups of farmers, very important. And then off-takers, whoever they might be, um, whether they're food companies or whether they are seed companies that want to buy the seed and then sell it on themselves. But the, at the bottom is the conducive environment. That's extremely important. And I'll say something about what we do in those areas, too. A couple of quick examples. Um, one is we're working on um, ways of um, um, de-risking investment in seed production. Of course, buying quality seed is a big outlay for a small farmer. So we've developed micro-insurance methods here, extremely affordable micro-insurance, fully automated. That's why it's affordable basically using satellite, automated weather data, crop models, uh, and, and e-banking uh, to actually make this really cheap and affordable, as, 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 as cheap and affordable it can get. And um, this now has got a commercial entity called Acre that we've set up, and uh, um, basically th this will help farmers invest in that seed. It's saying that if you have a drought, you get a payout straight away, not in three months, but in the same week. <laughs> and then you can reinvest or take your money and do something else. Uh, this is extremely important too. Not only lo loans, um, um, debt-based uh, loans, but uh, saving-based loans too. We work with MyAgro in, in West Africa here. They've got a very interesting scratch card system there for encouraging farmers to save and then invest. i quickly tell you about what we've been able to do so far. It gives you an example, a return on investment by taking this approach. Difficult crop, potato. Of course, farmers keep potato seed. It's a clonal crop. Uh, but like all farmer safe seed, it will dec decline quickly over time, and yields will halve over three, four, five uh, years. So we invested, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I moved the wrong one. <laughs> um, I beg your pardon. So uh, I'm at this slide here now. So this is um, uh, potato in Kenya. This shows uh, a, a, about a two million investment in total for putting the seed system together. Uh, USAID were involved, GIZ, SFSA, uh, ourselves. Two million dollars, and basically, I can give you the bottom line. Um, over a five-year period, we're, we're getting a return of about 16 million dollars in farmers' pockets. Now that's an example again where, where we've worked on is not only, this, not only the breeding, but also uh, help the seed company to set up, help link him up to the markets, help the farmers link up to the markets. We've developed uh, credit and, and risk management models for it. And um, as a result, farmers are quickly benefiting from, um, from that investment. Uh, I think Rob just made a point saying that, you know, if you have a bag of uh, soybeans, you can sell it. If you have a bag of potatoes, you can sell it too. It's the type of crop that basically takes, it takes uh, 
children through school, really. It's a very important crop, but a very difficult seed sector to get involved with. Um, so finally, I, I think i just say a couple of words on our offer. What can we offer here? Um, we, can, we can certainly uh, help drawing up profiles. We can do trials in many parts of the world, not only Africa, but Southeast Asia, where we know there's a huge demand for tropical soybean. We can work with aggregators. We can work with um, uh, registration and harmonized registration, taking advantage of our knowledge of of how to register in a number of countries at the same time to get the cost down. We work with local partners, seed company partners, licensing negotiations, uh, work with smallholders uh, um, in all senses in terms of their aggregation, the insurance credit and savings, um, and look at what we call off-taker contracts. So in other words, that's what's looking at the processor and getting them involved in early. This is how you would overlay it, I guess. So it's an example of um, uh, you know, where the, who the breeders might be, who the seed companies might be, the aggregations that we could work with, the off-taker organizations that are important in keeping this going, and that conducive environment. So that's, that's, uh, that's the horse. Uh, and. and before the cart, um, in a nutshell. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions I can. I've got some further information. And in particular, please uh, contact us if you'd like more information, uh, especially Ian Barker, who runs the Seeds to Be program, um, and uh, would be happy to help. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Mike. Questions in the room? Fawzi Hashim, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. Actually, I have two questions. The first one, you talked about breeding. Is there any trend or intention to breed for efficient nitrogen fixation with soybean? This will take care of the usage of chemical fertilizers. The second question is for soybean production in Africa or West Africa in particular. What is the potential processing for mm. soybean in this region? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For soybean, yeah. Um, well, thank you very for your question. Um, uh, we're not breeders ourselves. Um, of course, uh, Syngenta is a breeder, uh, but um, I can't talk for them uh, in terms of what they're investing in now. We know, of course, that there is an interest in NUE um, or nitrogen use efficiency traits. And, um, and uh, I think if there is strong demand uh, there by farmers especially, then it might, uh, you know, it, it may make, um, it may take hold. I, there's, um, it's, it's, um, uh, it, 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 if it does lead, if it does lead to farmers getting same yields in a sustainable way over many years, right, using less inputs, then I think it would be a great, great contribution. Question is, does it? We're not quite sure yet whether it does. The second question about processing, I think we heard earlier, there's great opportunities now. There's the feed sector starting up. There's interest in the oil, in oil processing. We're actually looking now, in East Africa at least, to get a map of who are the big processors and what can be, you know, what, what, what are they looking at uh, to line them up um, if there's any interest to move forward in this. So I'm confident that I think I can see uh, uh, demand from processing side for s tropical soybean, yeah. Great, a question from the webinar. Um, this is from Lloyd LePage and was also echoed um, by a couple of other webinar participants. Okay. Um, he's joining us from Iowa. And he said, glad to see the emphasis on demand characteristics. 
Um, you mentioned processing traits, which is an essential component mm. on the food demand side. And the question is, how are you working with private sector processors in Africa to determine their needs? Mm. Mm. Well, I can't give you the example yet for soybean because we haven't done it, uh, but we'd love to do it. I, 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 I'll tell you what, how it will transpire. It'll transpire that you get those processes involved in the trials at an early stage when you're doing trials of 12 different varieties to see if they are um, uh, adapted, tropically adapted, that's the time when you want those 12 different varieties also to be tested for you know, oil quality or protein quality or whatever else it is. That's what we did with potato. So we had the people involved, the crisping potatoes especially, uh, um, right at the point where we're doing, m testing many varieties. It's too late to wait till till you've only got one, uh, then they have no choice and no say. So you've got to do it earlier, and the earlier the better. I think that's, uh, that's the answer, Lloyd. I think we've got to do it. Uh, and we need people that kind of, kind of integrate <laughs> approaches. I think, I, think that's, I think that's what we're trying to specialize in. We're trying to fill that gap, um, develop partnerships, public, private, and actually use what resources and capacity we have, some money that we have, to actually get on with the job and not wait for, um, you know, wait, wait for the outside world to come and fund it. So we know it's a critical gap and we're prepared to spend our money on that. Um, before we take the next question, there is a follow-up answer for the first question. Hi, I'm Eberson Calvo from TMG Brazil. It's just a comment uh, to the question that that gentleman made. Uh, we, the experience in Brazil, uh, there was a lot of work, not only in breeding for the nitrogen efficiency on the plant side, but there was a lot done in the bacteria, in the rhizobia side. So that's certainly one thing that was a huge contribution for our soybean in Brazil, and I think it's worth doing in, in Africa too. Okay. Uh, that's a very good comment. That and probably I, I should have mentioned more about that. It should be part of the equation here. I think there is a risk that we we'll take for granted that the soybean will, uh, you know, just use the naturally available rhizobia. But in reality, I think that's going to be difficult, especially in the tough soil environments. Uh, and so, actually, we're going to have to incentivize like has been done in Nigeria, works very well there. Terbs, so we'd like to see more producers of rhizobium, and that's got to be part of the solution. I'm Dave Meese. I'm a plant breeding consultant. A uh, question actually not from Mike, but more the people in Western Africa as to over the past 40 years or so, whether there has been a very significant part of consumer preference on the final product to say that these particular varieties are much more acceptable than others in terms of the consumer? Anyone want to comment on the question? I think the best way to answer that is they haven't had much choice. Mm. The the consumers, for, for home use, I think is what we're talking about, flavor and mm -hmm. things like that, they haven't had much choice. And um, mm -hmm. the, the, the processing techniques that they've been using at home level basically take care of the problems with soybean. They grind it into flour, mm -hmm. so you don't have to cook it along, you don't have to worry about cooking time. And they cook it, so you don't have to worry about trips and inhibitor. And then they've had a bunch of flavors, so you don't have to worry about taste. So anyway, that's my, uh, that's the plant breeder's view of what has happened in West Africa. Yeah, he can spoke for the home processors. What we see, the commercial, the large scale processors, they are very keen about the oil content. When they come to us to say we want to have the, to process, they are always talking about the percentage of oil they can extract from the soybean. And uh, 
uh, I already asked them why they say well, that is one major product they are processing soya bean in West Africa for. But as Ken said, we are very so overwhelmed by the production constraints that we don't, uh, the farmers themselves do not look for the, the, the areas of quality that maybe the people in the US will look for because they already are producing large volumes. So we try to actually eliminate the production constraints in our work. Thank you. Question from online. This is another question from um, Subramanayam, um, Sumbar, I think um, they told me that I could call them. Um, and the question is, have you encountered issues related to GMO versus non-GMO seeds with any of the crops that you have worked with in any of the African countries? Have we encountered issues? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, well, actually, uh, we, we don't feel that we're in, as a foundation, I mean, I'm speaking for my organization, we don't feel actually we're in a position to really uh, drive uh, the agenda on, on GM in Africa. It's, it's, it's something that has to be dealt with at the policy level, national level, uh, in, in combination with... Um, with the technology owners at the end of the day. As we see, I think probably the success that exists in this part of the world with that type of um, technology is very much uh, the ability to steward the technology, look after it, be careful with it, and use it in a, in a, in, in a uh, you know, um, uh, a responsible manner. And, and um, I think therefore public-private partnerships are really important in terms of delivering benefits from that technology uh, when 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 and where they um, are due to happen in Africa is um, is not uh, something uh, I can give you a definitive answer on um, again Sholni Vibadda from Michigan State University I was wondering uh, you showed some countries where you have a focus on is that like just, are you open to working with other countries or? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I think those are our bases. I think, I think especially, you know, we, we work out some hubs. So we actually, although we have an office in Mali, we would work over the five, six, seven different West African countries. Um, likewise in East Africa. So I think I gave you the example there of the hubs that we have, have around, uh, around, the, um, around the world and where we have some teams and capacity to do work on the ground. But I think you can draw a large circle around those areas where we might actually uh, end up doing the work. Yeah, my name is uh, David Chikoy. I'm from IIT based in okay. Southern Africa. Um, I wanted to comment on this issue of GMOs. In countries like Zambia, Malawi, Mozambique, I mean, GMOs, that's no goes on. I think I remember about a couple of years ago, five years ago, Zambia had a shortfall of maize, okay? Then WFP actually imported GMO maize into the country. And the moment uh, senior government officials learned about that, that maize was actually shipped out of the country. Um, if you are importing germplasm, soybean germplasm in Mozambique, one of the requirements, as you do the documentation, is that we actually have to state whether it is GMO or non-GMO. And if you show that it actually is a GMO crop, you won't be allowed to import the testing material in the country. Actually, as a matter of fact, uh, there is a lot of demand for non-GMO soybean in South Africa. So this actually creates additional market demand for the non-GMO soybean for all those countries which are surrounding um, South Africa. And also there is, there is demand actually coming from the European markets. A country like Norway, they go out there in Southern Africa looking for non-GMO soybean uh, grain. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, a question from the webinar, this is from Robert Navin. And the question is, what can be done and by whom 
to strengthen the linkage between African soybean researchers mm. and African commercial buyers of soybeans in order to shape research so that soybean production is more profitable? Well, thanks. That's the question just for me, because that's exactly what I'm, <laughs> that's exactly the type of offer I'm making. And it's interesting that, that there aren't that many organizations that try and bridge that gap, and we'd love to see more partners help us. Oh, I could add that we are actually trying to um, build that capacity in some organizations. So, for example, we're working with the AATF, um, especially for one of the tech transfer models uh, and helping AATF understand the process, the regulatory processes that registration has to go through, ownership models, etc. So we're trying to build capacity in other organizations too. And AATF are a long-term partner for us. We're, but we'd, we'd love to have more partners. Thank you. Again, Tom Shaw from CRS. Um, I have a question about your weather-indexed crop yeah. insurance mm. in terms of the pricing, the scale, mm. uh, the delivery platform, and what type of reinsurance you're using to manage that. This is one of my specialties. So I'm just curious as to okay. how you're Well, of course, we can, uh, we, I can give you many, much more detail uh, outside of uh, this particular, you know, my standing up here. But... Um, um, in, out of those, which you, would you want me to... The cost, as I said, I think we do the best to try and get the cost down almost to the point where it's insignificant extra cost. And there may be some models emerging where the cost to the farmer may be eliminated. May, there are some models where we're trying, re, replanting models that we're looking at now, where the seed company itself is happy to carry that risk, providing they know what the risk is. And so therefore, that's one of your other questions. What is the risk? How do, you, how do we go about that? Well, it's an iterative process of improvement. And, and I think our experience uh, it, you know, is very important there to try and, and engage the risk very accurately so that we can get the, ultimately the reinsurance price down as far as possible. Um, if there's one bit to that one bit that will, that will help manage the long-term cost is getting the best deal for reinsurance. Uh, and so because it's still a new area, really, for reinsurers, um, they're aggressive still. But I think as competition increases, uh, we hope to get the cost down there. Technology that we're using increasingly in involves satellite technology. But, of course, that needs to go through a process of ground basing, you know, and, and so um, um, uh, the combination of two are very important. Um, mobile phone technology is extremely important in the case of East Africa, certainly Kenya, where we've uh, trialed it. And um, now I think we're looking at probably about a quarter of a million farmers insured this year, something like that, 250 or 300,000 farmers insured. But if it can be, if it, the, the route to scale is um, through the seed companies. We need to encourage them all to take this sort of thing on. And then secondly, um, also in supporting national programs of insurance. We know, we know insurance is very important for national program, for government policies. And we know, of course, it's extremely expensive. So if we can do anything to help national programs w improve their technology, um, uh, get, the, get the local cost down, then more farmers would have access uh, to the benefits of insurance. Good morning. I'm Annie D. I'm a soybean farmer in Alabama. Good morning. And I'm going to address the... GMO, non-GMO question that somebody asked a minute ago. I was one of the people that really held out on participating in the GMOs, and uh, I was one of the last non-GMO large farmers in Alabama. And I think um, Dr. Bertram said it earlier that this is uh, about science, and I think that policy will have to be addressed and we'll have to help some of those countries in Africa understand that the best genetics are now in GMOs, and if we're going to feed over 9 billion people by the year 2050, 
we're going to have to try to help them understand the science part of that, and we're going to have to work on that part of it. Last question from the online participant. Um, this question is from Dick Tinsley. Again, um, he's located in Colorado. And um, he was wondering, Mike, if you have the government support for a certified seed program um, to oversee the seed certification programs, or will they mostly be on the honor system? Oh, no. It, I, um, the, those countries where we work have, um, have um, governments in those countries have opened their doors. So it's those that, again, have more liberal seed policy see the importance of trying to strengthen the seed sector in their countries and, and, and make available to their farmers uh, and subsequently, you know, their um, food systems uh, quality, quality uh, seed. So we work very closely uh, with governments to uh, adapt their policies, but, uh, but you raise the very important thing for certain crops is certification capacity is really important. Maybe that's one of the things that's going to be critical for soybean too, in terms of uh, the offer a soybean seed company has. You could have a certified product, certainly you know what's in the bag, you know it's clean, you know it's got a whatever 90 something percent germination rate um, and you know you, you you know it's got certain oil properties whatever they might be but knowing what's in the bag I think may be really important bit to get right with um, putting in place this seed system in in Africa for this crop thank you good question yeah Um, one more question oh. from the webinar. This question is from Marshall Martin, and um, he says quality seeds adapted to tropical conditions are important, but he's wondering, are you working on best management practices to control diseases, insects, and weeds through either variety selection or educational and marketing programs for pesticide use by small holders? Okay. Well, of course, I mean, and many people do that too. Of course, all of the researchers here look at the pest and disease uh, resistance. I said that sort of those boxes on the left-hand side is bread and butter for, for breeders. Um, and, then, and then in terms of working with farmers to help um, them um, carry out the best possible practices in the field, that's a, that's a really tricky part, and it's... Uh, uh, of course, extension, as we know, uh, can have various forms, and, and the forms that are most applicable to, mm, let's say, African farmers um, include, uh, you know, in include and uh, necessitate the support of organizations working at scale like Technoserve and, and CRS. It's really important that they continue, as well as the national extension programs to work together to educate farmers. We'd love to see more of the private sector getting involved in especially technologies like crop protection. They have a duty and I think uh, mostly carry out that duty in, of, of stewardship and training. Um, but the the the, the the bigger, the longer term answer is continuing to support this. It's not a, it's an expensive matter extension. It does need, it does need brute force and numbers. Um, it's not particularly scalable. Hopefully as we get more, I don't know, technology, IT, et cetera, available to farmers, it might, and, and usable by farmers, then it might get, uh, then it might get cheaper. But in the meantime, we really depend on, on the uh, good services of uh, what we call aggregators here, organizations working directly with farmers, whether it's uh, public or private or third <coughs> sector. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Robinson. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you very much.